Well, welcome everyone. Again, this is Jennifer Witt. I am the director of Project the Line. With me is Tom Kellen, our technical director. So say hello, Tom. Hi, all. So Tom has been busy in the background ask, answering multiple questions. and We want to thank you and encourage you to continue to at, ask questions using your side, uh, the panel on the right-hand part of your screen. So I'm going to, I'm going to have Tom talk a little bit about some of the technical questions that always come up just before we start the broadcast because hopefully that will minimize some of the questions and hopefully get you on board before we start. So Tom, can you address some of the things about recording the session and things that might happen that people commonly ask? Sure, come on. So everyone can hear? All right, uh, no, no problem. Some of the common things that pe people run across is um, if you're screen isn't updating or you can't see the presentation, uh, sometimes just minimizing the webinar window and then maximizing that back up again will fix that problem. If the audio is not real clear um, and you're having trouble hearing us, you may need to just disconnect from the webinar and reconnect. You know, the, it, This goes across the internet, so uh, there's a lot of different machines in between all of us, so sometimes that's all you need to do is just uh, drop off the webinar and then reconnect and that will probably fix your um, your audio problems. This is going to be basically audio only in that you'll be able to hear Jennifer uh, speak and you can type questions to her here but we're not going to actually uh, have you all speaking. There's no interaction that way. So interaction for you guys is just to type it in the question box and we will try and answer your questions as we go along. Great. Thanks Tom. Again I want to hit a few other things. So during this session we want you to get involved. Again we just keep encouraging you to ask questions. You you already are, many people have been on early already asking, so thank you. For those of you who use Twitter, if you want to tweet any of the tips, one thing that we find very helpful, and we're all sharing, it's where I get a lot of my research and my own tips, is using Twitter and many of the other social uh, media outlets. So if you use Twitter, you can use at Project Tips. If you are not subscribed to at Project Tips, it's... Um, the Twitter handle for projectmanager.com. So we're constantly, we're constantly tweeting out twips, uh, <laughs> tips and research that we find. And also you can use the handle pound or hashtag project manager, all one word. And that, that distributes content out to people who have uh, looked for that hashtag. Again, we're recording this and the link will be sent. And again, for PMPs who are earning PDUs, then yes, this does qualify for a Category C PDU. So what that means is at the end of the webinar, all you need to do is go to PMI.org, log into your, your account, and register your PDUs with PMI. And you can use the, the vendor or provider as projectmanager.com. Again, as we go along, we're going to be handling a lot of content. Is For those of you who have attended some of my webinars, I try to pack in a lot of information. There are some questions you may have that I may put on the parking lot, meaning that we have other, if you go to projectmanager.com, you'll see other future events or webinars that we have. So we'll be addressing some things in future events. Some of the questions you may have, I may say, hold that thought. And what that means is, is that we'll cover that question later on in the presentation. So just a little bit about myself is um, I'm a student of projects and teams. I, I study how we screw them up and how we fix them. I study how some project managers are really productive. And you see this all the time. You see some of your peers get promoted and you ask, well, why did they get promoted and I didn't? Or how do they get on to more interesting projects and I don't? Some of the working with members of project, uh, projectmanager.com community, I see people with amazing credentials. And beyond their technical competencies, I can see their ability to keep their teams motivated and get things done. Just you can tell, and they're very active. They're asking questions. They're answering questions for people. So it's always helpful. And those people stand out. And amazing enough is I, I myself have experienced uh, getting opportunities just by you know being helpful the term pay it forward really does apply so pay it forward for those of you who are learning project management you you probably know more than some other people in your group so you can share information up down and all around so I've been blessed to 
um, pioneer some leading edge technologies in, in the project management space, including some of the social media and mobile learning, specifically here at projectmanager.com and being involved in the projectmanager.com as they've um, enhanced their own software to become more social and, and collaborative and more mobile and global. So I'm very fortunate and have seen, again, a lot of, I've seen a lot of things that have worked and a lot of things that have failed and try to share that information. For those of you who saw my picture on the front, I'm totally gray, so I say to people, those, everyone is earned and um, it's due to experience. So in today's webinar, instead of waiting to the end, so right out of the gate, I'm going to share what we're seeing in our global community of over 500,000 project managers. So within, again, the projectmanager.com, if you're involved in our LinkedIn community or in our, on our blog or any other outlets that we have, there are over 500,000 project managers that you can collaborate with. We're always conducting research and looking at what are people struggling with. You know, what are they struggling with as, as the times are changing, global economy, you know, what are the new trends, and just trying to stay abreast of of what's happening in the market and trying to help really stimulate project management. And so I'm going to come out of the gate with some things we're seeing and stay tuned to the end. There's some amazing research that's been conducted by MIT. Actually it's been a long time ago. Research done by MIT and funded by the Federal Reserve Bank regarding the real truth about what drives us and an alternative approach to the typical carrot approach used by many organizations that I know everyone has seen. So specifically in looking at our agenda, I'm going to cover information about leading teams, managing projects, motivating people, and what are some next steps that we can take. So I always like to ground myself by, when I look at terms, I see people, even myself, sometimes if I go too fast or not really paying attention, I can be kind of sloppy in how I use some of the terms. And I see that too in other outlets. So when I do that, I like to reground myself by going to look at the definitions of some of these terms. So I'll be clarifying what does, I like to look at what does lead mean? You know, what's the definition according to dictionary.com if you're online? I get to where I use everything online. So dictionary.com, if I look up lead, if I look up manage, if I look up motivate, what does that really mean? So in looking at today's session, you, you know, we ask, where did this session come from? Like, why are we doing this session? Again, looking at what people are struggling with, look at what the questions people are asking. We're looking at how can we, you know, how can we manage project teams more effectively and get greater project results. So here are some of the common scenarios we see. And so see if any of these either you can relate to now or if you have been able to relate to in the past. So some scenarios go like this. I just got assigned as the project manager and I've never been a project management project manager before and I have no idea where to start. So where do I start? How do I even how do I manage a project? So the term that we've probably all seen is the accidental project manager. So many of us, including myself, uh, start in project management by you just happen to happen to have been there. And so what do we do when we find ourselves in that situation? Another scenario is I'm leading a big project and the company just announced a major reorg. So we all know what that means, aka typically downsizing. And my team is checked out. How do I get my team motivated? So I'm sure we've seen, we've all experienced that in some form or fashion where there's either been a huge reorganization, there's been a downsizing, everybody immediately gets concerned. What does that mean for me? People are like, am I going to get moved to a different job? Am I going to get transferred to a different location? Or even, am I going to continue to have my job? So when that happens, people are not, the people on your team uh, lose motivation and they're not really thinking about their task on the team or their project. They're more concerned about their, their baseline needs. 
And the third scenario that we see commonly is, I just got promoted to project manager, and uh, no, one, no one is on my team, no one is listening. How do I leave my team when no one's listening? So what that means is, you know, many of us have been promoted within an organization. Uh, for myself, I have a technical background, so didn't come out of college with the project management certificate going, uh, doing job interviews for project manager jobs. I actually interviewed for a telecommunications company for a technical job. So worked many, many years at, in the, on the technical side and just found myself being promoted as a project manager. And you know, some other industries, whether it's insurance, whether it's construction or engineering, whether it's healthcare, that is very common where we start our career in one, in one area and we naturally progress to another. And many of us find ourselves with no training or no experience in those roles. So when that happens, many times if we are left to lead our peers, uh, it's hard for people who are our peers to now look at us as a leader uh, for many different reasons, whether there's competition, whether there's jealousy, whether there's credibility. Uh, there are all different scenarios, but what happens is commonly people find themselves promoted or now leading teams and no one's following, and worse yet, no one's listening. So those are some of the scenarios, and especially with today's market, with things changing, people finding themselves in different roles, uh, they've lost critical team members, and so these are some of the things we're trying to address today. So if we look at this continuum, there are four, four parts mainly three, leading teams, managing projects, and motivating people. So again, I like to look at the, they say we lead teams and lead people, and we manage projects. And more importantly, we motivate people. So we want to dissect these areas. So when we talk about leading teams, we're going to look at ten traits that we found of, of uh, great leaders, and four key factors that they possess and two other bonuses that uh, we like to throw in there too. And with managing projects, we feel like there are three ways that you can manage projects more effectively, six capabilities that are critical to have, and five tools that will help you be more effective in managing those projects. And then what I find fascinating in this section of the motivating people, you know, I read a lot and read a lot of research and do my own research the people aspects of the projects are my forte, and this research has been around for a long time, but we're going to talk a little bit again about the research conducted by MIT funded by the Federal Reserve Bank. And specifically, it's going to address the carrot and stick approach and give an alternative that I think that we all are experiencing now, what we're the phenomenon we see that um, has evolved over time that's more effective. And then last but certainly not least, we're going to look at next steps because we feel like it's critical to know once we learn this new information, and some of this is actually going to be a repeat or a reminder for many of you on the call, but what's the next step? What is that one thing? What's that one thing that I can do? You know, we feel like it's important when, you, when we cover a lot of material is knowing what's one thing I can take back and implement immediately. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about today. So in looking at leading teams, leading teams, again, there are 10 traits, four key factors, and two bonuses. So here are the 10 traits of a great leader. So if you wa ever walked into your project and looked around and see no one's there, I know that's happened to me, and if by chance that's ever happened to you, it's safe to say that you're probably not leading your team. It's happened to most of us at one point or another, and one of the most popular and debated questions we are asked is, what are the traits of a great leader? You know, if you Google, if you go to your browser and Google the term leader, you get over a million results. There, everyone has an opinion, there are different thoughts, there's a lot of research on leadership and how really, how really to lead teams. So we've had some great discussions and heard varying opinions from everywhere. But today, what I'm going to present here is um, the time and experience 
what it's taught me and the leadership traits that I look at. And when I find myself following someone, the things that have attracted me to follow that person. So here are 10 traits that I look for in a great leader and try to replicate myself. So my question to you today is to realize and be more aware of who do you follow? Who do you follow? I mean, when you follow someone, it means that you're doing it on your own accord, so no one's forcing you. So just be aware of like what makes what what do I find inspiring about that person? Why do I want to be on their projects? Why do I want to, you know, participate in their causes? What makes you want to follow them? And if you're following a great leader, begin studying them and try to develop those or incorporate those into your own. So here, here are some of the things that I find commonly when I sat down and wrote down the great leaders of the people that I found that myself following. Here are the traits that I found in the ones that I'm trying to replicate. So see what's true for you and make your own list if, if it's different. So to me, a great leader is grounded and centered, meaning great leaders can't be knocked off base because they're grounded and, and centered. You know, a lot of times things happen on projects and we just get, we feel like we just got knocked behind the head and then we go spiraling. And then if we go spiraling, the teams follow. So I feel like great leaders are so grounded and so centered in what they do that they do, it's hard to knock them off center. They have a strategic pause. And when things happen, they actually take the time to decide instead of react. They don't just react to things, they stop, assess, and then decide, they don't react. I, th I feel like great leaders are aware and mindful, meaning this, great leaders are very aware and mindful of not only themselves, like what are, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses, uh, but their team members and those they interact with. So they really study and understand innately themselves and, and other people. They see how to get people to work together effectively because they think about things like things like patterns. And they ask, what are my patterns? What do I usually do? Like, do I do, do the same old, same old? What is my same old, same old reaction? If this problem occurs on my projects, you know, how do I react? Or if someone on my team, if you're the project manager, and someone on your team approaches you, you know, we all have our patterns and we find ourselves reacting the same way. So really, once we're mindful and aware of our patterns and how we act, then we can start studying them and try to change them to be more effective. Things are like triggers, knowing that, you know, if you're a project leader, if you're a project leader and your team members, they look up to you. So in, in, when we find ourselves in these situations, being a leader of other people, they put projections on us, or they can. They may project on you. Uh, a sister or a brother or a sibling, uh, maybe a parent. So realizing that if someone reacts to you in like a triggered state for no apparent reason, really know that it really has nothing to do with you and understanding how to handle those situations effectively. Great leaders have these things in mind or are um, taking it all into consideration as they work around and among team members and people they're leading. So um, great leaders create solutions. They look at a bigger picture, and they think of ways to do things more creatively and consider things that haven't been done before. Great leaders, are, they analyze facts and look at patterns and what needs to be done. They evaluate risk and evaluate what will occur if action A is taken over action B and prepares by putting plans in place. And they, they're great about generating a sense of urgency. You know, a lot of times in our projects, uh, when things get stale or just can't seem to happen, for some of the scenarios that we interjected in the beginning, it's hard when people get paralyzed on our teams. Maybe there's a fear. We just really don't know which way to go. A great leader has a sense of urgency and gets their teams engaged. So urgency with the team to get things done. They get people to be able to spring into action. A great leader uses insight. And intuition is a tool that we all have, but a lot of times we don't use it. We forget about it, and it gets out of tune because we stop li listening to ourselves. I'm sure everyone, uh, there's no doubt we all have in intuition, but which leads us to use our insights. But if we always analyze ourselves, try to analyze it, psychoanalyze it, and we put our brain in and we 
especially if we're basing things based on facts that you know are not accurate, we're going to uh, lose we're going to lose the tuneness of our insights and intuition because we're going to start doubting ourselves. And a great leader is great about building team cohesion among team members and people involved in initiatives so they work together. And then motivate people. So we're going to talk about this one a little bit more later on. It's the third item, again, around the research about motivating people. And, you know, they're great about having people on their team who want to be there. They want to be involved and engaged and believe in the cause. And a great leader, again, achieves results. More importantly, again, it's about getting results. So project managers, again, there's the side, the managing the project, but it's the leading the team. So when we lead the teams, then they achieve the results. So those are, I feel like, some of the, the top ten traits of a great leader of the people that I study. And again, you will have your own, but these are, these are pretty common. Your list may be different, but again, identify who it is and study and replicate it. And I think there are a tip here, here on the screen is to model the leader, study them. I'll move this board over. And what we found is some bonuses, two things. They have mentors and they have mentees. So the thing about mentors, they're always learning. Mentors are people who have been there done that of what you're trying to do and they help you help guide you. Um, I see people today uh, leveraging certain people as what they think are mentors and instead they're actually colleagues or peers. So I guess a colleague or peer could be a mentor if they have truly done what you're trying to do and they've been there and done that but most of the people that are truly our colleagues or peers are at our same level. So we want to be learning and growing from people who have done more than us. They've, done, they've already been there, done that. We learn from them. They learn, we learn from the lessons learned. And then mentees. So it's important to have mentees because people, you know, I, I find myself learning from other people who are my mentees. They learn from me. I learn from them. Um, my mentees usually have me look at things a little bit differently just like I do. Um, every summer I have interns from Hong Kong and they're in their graduate students and so they come over to the States for uh, the summer and I love working with them. They have new energy, they have new ideas and they challenge me to look at things that I never would have looked at and likewise I do the same for them. So it's cyclic between having mentors and mentees. So Though if you look at great leaders, they're I mean they're not the end all be all. They're all they're learners. So the key factors over to the right, you'll see they have a just an innate curiosity. They're always asking questions. They're looking at things from different perspectives, from multiple angles. They ask great questions. And for people on their teams or that they're involved with, they they ask the questions and they they get the people to think about for themselves how best to handle any situation. So they don't necessarily give the people all the answers, but they do ask the right questions to get them to be thinking about the right things so they can assess and make the right determinations. And we find the key factor is they're always learning. Leaders are, leaders are readers and readers are leaders, so they have an innate uh, ability and love for learning and they have a passion for what they're doing and the curiosity fuels their learning and passion for what they do. So those are some of the things that I think when we look at leading teams it's important to to remember because if you look at the term again if you go to dictionary.com and you pull up the word lead it means an example for others to follow. So in the beginning, when I ask the question, you know, if you ever looked around and no one's there, then you're not leading. If no one's following you, you're not leading. But knowing there is their philosophy where you can lead behind, but the general consensus is you're, you're the guide, you're the one to go first, and you're the one to lead others as an example. And if we contrast that to manage, if you likewise look at dictionary.com and look up the term manage, it's more about control, controlling things. So that's why we like to lead people 
and manage projects because projects it's looking at, although we have people on our projects, um, the, the thing we're doing there is controlling tasks, task activities, all the things that have to be done in order to produce the deliverables and drive the results. So the next topic we're looking at managing projects. We feel like there are three ways, three ways to manage your project more effectively and six capabilities that you need to have and five tools. So let's take a look at those. So three ways to best manage your project. A key word always is to organize your work. It's got to specifically organize your work around three areas to maximize time and efficiency. So first, share project plans easily. In many organizations, there's no way for people to access documents easily. I mean, some organizations I've looked at, they're literal file folders in someone's drawer or someone's desk or a pile on someone's desk. So today, with the with global projects, um, if you're not on a global project, you know maybe your project team members are in another building, they're on another floor. So having things in a pile on your desk or in someone's file cabinet is not effective for running projects, um, managing projects effectively today. So having a way for everyone to share the project plans easily. Second is managing teams online, providing a mechanism for team members to go online so that you can manage and assign tasks and where they can actually complete and report their status. So one, one thing we find is, you know, if people can't access or give you their status, then what happens is when we call for it and they have to do it maybe at the end of the day or the end of the month, they're just going to make things up. So if people are making up information, that's, that's exactly what's going to feed into your project status report that goes to your change control board, your stakeholders, your executive team. So garbage in equal garbage out. So you want to be able to manage your team activities online just so people can access them and do it more real time. And the, which leads into the third one is pra, uh, tracking progress daily, more real time. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, people are always wanting to know what's the status right now. I'm commonly between, I travel a lot, so I'm commonly on the road or in an airport or always out of my office and people want to know real time. So you want to have tools available that you can access easily and get a status or have someone pull it up in your absence so they'll know real time what's happening. So if these mechanisms are in place and accessible to your team members, as they complete the items you can report progress to your executives, shareholders and stakeholders and everybody sees what's happening in real time. So we feel like these are the three ways to best manage your project. So now let's look at six capabilities that you must have in order to manage your projects better. So here are six. And again, this is under the bucket of managing your projects. So remember, it's managing your task activities, uh, the deliverables, and the timelines, your schedules. So first, you must have a dashboard and be able to assess the health and the health and wealth of your project. So at a glance you can see if it's on track or off track or where there's red, yellow, or green statuses. Uh, a lot of executives like the red, yellow, green. And I have to say, I like it myself. It's more of a visual of what's happening on your team. So your team members need to be able to see the status of the projects also. The more they can see, the more they know because they're being impacted as well. So second, you must have a project planning tool in place to be able to plan tasks, resources, timelines, and milestones. And also an intelligent reporting tool. Not only do you need to see the reports of your project, but also uh, your team members need that too. If they have work contingent upon someone else's completing, someone else completing their items, then they need to know if something's going to be late so they can plan accordingly, get any other uh, contingencies in place. And executives and stakeholders also need to see the project reports. So the more that you can give people to see at their level, you know, don't, we've talked many times about uh, providing results or statuses to the people at the right levels. So just making sure that the right people get the right status at the right level. And then you need a, tr a tool to track results of the task, of the people, of the resources, assets, and your budget and collaborate online. More and more, and uh, I mean, we have over 500,000 people in the project 
manager.com community. So that right there in itself shows you more and more people are going online to collaborate. It's, it's very important. Uh, if you go to our LinkedIn group or any other, there are uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn limits how many groups that you can subscribe to, but I'm subscribed to like the limit. I think there are 50. But you can go, you can go to LinkedIn and you can do a search for project manage project management communities or for those of you who are PMP, you can search for PMP and you can join these groups and you can see how people are collaborating. They're collaborating on real-time issues, uh, things that are happening in their industry, maybe if it's a certain vertical, certain area, certain technology, they're collaborating real-time. So team members like to collaborate on your project too. So if they're in the same building or different floors, if they're in the same city, they may be in different buildings, people from around the globe are working together on projects. So the more collaborative you can make your systems and your tools and your capabilities, the more, uh, the more people are going to provide information that's going to have you build your schedules, your plans more realistically. So an online environment is critical for teams today to be able to access documents, collaborate, communicate, and get feedback in real time. So if you're wondering where to look for these six capabilities, you know, um, you're on the call today um, hosted by projectmanager.com and people have been str struggling where to find these tools. Like how can I find all of these things? So the team has worked very hard to pull this together and incorporate. They just, we just um, launched a new version to incorporate even more capabilities. So it incorporates these capabilities to help deliver on three ways to best manage your projects more importantly, organize your work. So people ask all the time, what are five tools to help you manage your projects more effectively? So here are five categories um, that I find that I'm always struggling with that people are asking about. And so here are my top five recommendations based on, again, questions coming in from the community, conversations we're having, things that we're doing with, the, with our corporate clients. So number one, planning and task management. So being able to, um, if you need an online tool that can be accessed remotely, I'm rarely in my office. I'm typically off-site or traveling. So the best tool I've found, again, to pull in multiple things of all the projects is, is in truth, projectmanager.com. There are a lot of different tools that handle only select things. There are some tools that are only calendaring, some tools that only handle task, uh, some tools who handle invoicing, but over time what projectmanager.com has done is pulled all these together. So for right now, the one with the integrated solution is projectmanager.com. The other thing that project managers struggle with is, is handling financial spend. So what does that even mean? Because some people don't, some people, we're project managers are responsible for financial spend, but maybe they have other groups and organizations. Many project management tools today allow me to input data, but they don't allow me to manipulate it quickly, quickly enough, because a lot of times I get called into meetings, especially with executives or stakeholders regarding numbers and budgets. And so what I found is to manage financial spend, I export the data from the tool to Excel. I love Excel because you can put filters on it, you can manipulate it with macros and filter any information and calculate things quickly. Um, and that way, if I send it or distribute that information to other people, then it's commonplace that people have Excel. So Excel is uh, pretty much an industry standard. People get, get to it easily, they can pull it up. You don't have to learn that much about it. It's very self-explanatory. Number three is I need a communications tool. I need to talk with people. I need to talk with people all over the world, globally. And what everybody has access to now is Skype. So Skype is, a, um, a, you can go to Skype. It's uh, just um, like on the screen, Skype.com. So Skype.com is free. Literally, you can talk to people all over the world. Our core team is in New Zealand and our founder is in uh, the south of France, and then we've got a team here in the States. So we use Skype, and we're working with those teams, and I have other teams globally. So Skype.com is, uh, you can access it from your computer or your mobile phone. 
It's easy and economical way to communicate internationally. Their rates are really good. So number four is meetings and presentations. So I feel like I spend my life giving some kind of presentation about something. And I've, I, there are different ones out there, more coming available today. The one that's easiest for me to get in and, and set up quickly that my end users can access without a lot of training is GoToMeeting, GoToMeeting.com. You can go in, they have different pricing levels that you can join, so if you find yourself constantly doing presentations uh, where you're remotely or the people you're presenting to is remotely, it's a great tool and it allows you to host a small team or you know up to a thousand people. And the fifth one is mobility and productivity. So it's designed for your mobile device of choice. So my favorite traveling companion is my iPhone. So there are Blackberries, I know there are Razors, there are other uh, in essence, they're smartphones. So the smartphones are built today for mobility and productivity. Uh, there's a lot of research that goes into apps for productivity. So I, it's, it's hard. <laughs> I go crazy searching for apps. I love, especially if I'm on a plane ride, I'm just searching for different apps because they make my life easier. And actually now, there's one recently recently launched from projectmanager.com. So for those of you who have an account on projectmanager.com, you can go to, again, I'm an, an, an iPhone user, so I go to my Apple, my App Store, and I can download, I downloaded projectmanager.com. And now I can log in and I can view my projects, my tasks, my calendars, messages from people. So, and there are more, there are just, I mean, there are thousands of apps out there. So I use the calendar, I use my calendar. People ask, well, what are some of the apps? What are some of the apps you use? So, uh, or what are some of the things on your smartphone? So on my smartphone, again, I have an iPhone and other people have other ones, but I use my calendar, my camera. I love being in a meeting and writing notes on the board. Have you ever been frantically trying to write the notes before they get erased? Well, now I love having my camera. So I just take a picture and then we can just distribute it. We used to try to type the notes up so pretty. Um, but now we just literally take a, a picture and we email the image to all the team members. It works great. And then some of the other ones, I travel, I fly Delta a lot, so Delta has an app. It keeps me, if uh, I get to see if my flights are canceled or not. So for those travelers, I know a lot of people, that I know personally on the call are travelers. So there's Delta, there's TripIt. And again, for social, for social and collaboration, uh, many of you see me a lot on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Kindle. I, I travel a lot. I find myself on literally planes, trains, automobiles, and Kindles, uh, the Kindles, and now there's the Nook where you can read any kind of documents, books, information on those devices. And then with iTunes, I listen to music sessions. I record. Sometimes I record meetings, and then with meetings, I take things back. So if I'm in a meeting with my client, and uh, again, I get approval to record that session. Then if I get on the plane and go to my office, then I can work productively on the plane, maybe type up notes, action items, and things like that that I've recorded online. And then texting, you know, again, I'm out of the office a lot, and as I know many of you are, and texting is a, a good easy way that I don't have to log into my email. So all these tools, so when you look at these things, you know, in the past people have asked ask and questioned why am I doing that. So more and more technology is ca catching up with us. The key word here is portability and ag agility. Again, making our lives more easy and more effective. So though, these are the things we have to have in place to manage our project more effectively. They're just, they're not arguable anymore. They can't be. I mean, these are the things, it's like back in the day, uh, again, I worked for a telecommunications company, and I remember uh, when the mobile phone came out in, in the, uh, for me, came out in the 80s. And so I remember that bag phone, right? It's like carrying your brick around on my shoulder. And people are like, oh, why are you doing that? Who in the world would ever need a phone? Well, you know that argument, that was like a barroom brawl everywhere you went. People are just like, oh, you never need one of those. I don't know why you have that. Well, so now, you know, I, I don't even have a landline. I use my mobile phone. So now we're getting to the age where, you know, we've talked about these things. They've been argued. They've been debated. Now 
you know, if you don't have these things in place, then you're just behind. You're like in mobile phone times using a party line, party line or landline. So motivating people. So here is one of the really interesting things I found when we talk about, I'm going to cover four tips first and then talk about this research. So the four tips to motivate your people. So again, it's people, when, we, when you go to dictionary.com and you look up, or any other, any other place where you can look up a word, so for credible, credible meaning. So dictionary.com, if you look up motivate, it talks about stimulating towards action, to give incentive to, or to stimulate interest or enthusiasm. So it's like, how do I get my team enthused about working on the project? What do I need to do to motivate them into action? Well, here are four, four tips I want to cover first. So, you know, you've, here we, we've all been here. It's time to kick off that big project and, you know, keep our team motivated. So I, I've got a great example that early on in my career, I'll never forget, uh, I was, again, I told you I started in technology, so a lot of the implementations I did, I was working every weekend on technology upgrades. And we just had this problem that went on for months. And my manager at the time was Sue. And she constantly was in the middle of our group, uh, encouraging us, motivating us. She was there right in the thick of things with us. And I've never forgot that. I mean, we'd been working on a project again months on end, many long days and nights. And she came in. She fed us pizza. She helped you know, with whatever we needed done. And that's what I think about of keeping the team motivated, you know, whether it's a, an ongoing pro, uh, chronic issue on your project that you're trying to resolve, or if you're, you know, many projects last, you know, 18 months or a couple of years. And then, then I, I tell people I used to think my hardest project were those large enterprise Im implementations, but I found one of my worst ones was like with two people, small project, two people was like a nightmare. So whatever your scenario is, is keeping not only yourself motivated, but your team. So here are some things I think that's important. So one, set realistic goals. It's great to be excited and gung-ho when we first begin a new project and are formulating our plan, but don't neglect to get input and agreement from our team members about the workload, um, uh, especially for people who have, again, when we talk about accidental project managers and people have been promoted or moved up in the ranks or found themselves like walking down the hall one day and now they're found themselves managing a project, you know, sometimes it's easy for us to think, oh, I know that, I know that, I know how long it's going to take because you've had experience in that area. But it's important to get the input from our team members for multiple reasons and so you may not be doing those tasks anymore. Maybe you, yes, did it in your past. But if a new person is taking it, maybe they don't have your experience. Maybe they don't have your skill set or your training. So it might take them longer. Or you may have hired, you know, the superstar. So it may not take as long. So getting either way, whether it takes longer or not as long, you need to have your plan based on realistic timelines and realistic goals. And the other thing is measuring performance. I'm reminded of family trips, of repeatedly asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? So similarly, we need a tool that measures and tracks performance so, so that our team members know, are we there yet? And how much further? And did we get derailed? Did we do a U-turn? <laughs> do we have to go back? So how are we doing against the baseline of what we said we're going to do? And are we on track? Are we off track? And if so, how do we get back? How do we meet the goals that we set? And as a project manager, what support or resources might your team need to get us back on track? I think that's one of the most important questions in being aware is always asking, like, how can I support you? Because in essence, our team is our team, so they can make or break us. So providing the support, the training, the needs, whatever they need to set them up for success sets our entire project up for success and that goes a long way in motivating the team members. So if you ask them how can you support them, hey you're in their court now, you are on their team, you're not blocking, you know, you're not on the other team. So that is great for 
motivation and it provides support and tools but continue to measure performance and see how you are. Again, by asking support um, is really motivating. So celebrate success. So this is a big one. Celebrating success is not at the end of the project, but all along the way, even the small milestones. And you know, we can all say this again, I said in the beginning, some of this may be new, but some of this may be reminders. And I think this is one of the things that's a reminder for all of us. Hey, I'm raising my hand, guilty as charged. Because if my team and I get on a project and we're all forging ahead and trying to meet deadlines and things are changing, you know, it's easy. It's one of the easiest things to forget is celebrating our successes. So we're always looking ahead at what, what milestones are to be accomplished and we forget about the ones that have been completed. So if we celebrate along the way, then that's very motivating to the team. And just ignore, you know, it could, some people say, well, I don't have, I don't have enough money or funds. I can't do anything for my team because I don't have a budget for that. Well, this is one of the areas we're going to talk about more in just a few minutes about motivating people where it's not always about the money. Just acknowledging, hey, we met that. And just celebrating with the team, just, you know, a note, a note card or an email or an accolade. Be excited about it and look forward to the next one. So reward the team for achieving success and, more importantly, for working together as a team. So the focus is not on the one hero but on the team working together. So we can do that with simple measures. Me, I like, <laughs> again, a note card or simple word of thanks. Uh, today is Valentine's Day, so I started the call for those who observe the Valentine's Day holiday. Um, today is a perfect day just to say to your team, wow, I'm really glad you're on the team. Um, I'm glad that you're here to support me. We've done great. You've done a great job. Thank you for being here. Just acknowledging them. And then, you know, for me, I like pizza and chocolates. And now, now I use Starbucks cards. Or, you know, the dollar store has little things that you can go do. Here in the States, we have things called the dollar stores. And literally everything costs a dollar. So you can go get something and just for fun, you know, some a fun reminder. And then knowing your team. So if this is a detailed task and the person working on the task is not detail oriented, then that's going to be quite miserable. So it's good for you to realize that if they are, you know, if you require something detailed and the person's not, we need to know that and get them some support because um, we're, we can't, we're not wired to do everything. So it's being able to, to provide them support and also know whether or not a team member is an introvert or an extrovert. Uh, that's very important for certain roles. When we talk about rewarding and motivating the team, how we motivate an introvert is different than an extrovert. So an introvert doesn't like, you know, a lot of attention. They like the quiet, you know, mindful, you know, little accolades behind the scenes. And then the extrovert, you know, they, they do like the party. They do like the, the public accolades. So knowing those things are very important. So knowing these kind of things help you to help your team stay motivated. So in closing on this part of these four that we're talking about, simply be aware of the people on the team and of where they are on the project and what they need to succeed. Be mindful and treat people with respect and not drive them you know, to the next project. How many times have with your current team, you're finishing one project because the next big one is about to start and you don't give your, time, your team downtime well, they need downtime between to regenerate, revitalize, recharge their energy. So these are some of the things as a project manager. It's your responsibility to make sure your team is motivated during all aspects of the projects. So keywords are awareness and mindfulness. So here's, um, here's what I want to go into next to just a few minutes. Again, um, the... MIT, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the University of Chicago, Carnegie Mellon, uh, conducted this study. Uh, you, you can go Google this. Um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to provide you a link where you can see a very interesting uh, animated demonstration of this. It's very cool. Uh, but it's research that was funded by the Federal Reserve System. So two studies were done. I'm going to go ahead. See at the bottom. Drive, if you go to uh, 
YouTube and you type Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us by Dan Pink. So Dan did a talk on this and there is a company, RSA, that animated this and it's very cool. So if you look on the screen, again, it's um, they did two studies. So they looked at if you reward something, do you get more of the behavior that you want? And likewise, they looked at if you punish something, do you get less of the behavior you want? So those of you with children, I know this is a constant study, and you've done millions of experiments. So you probably have your own research that, you can, that you've conducted and results that you like to report. But again, this study was done at MIT, and they looked at uh, three, three levels. They looked at student, a group of students first, and they looked at three levels of rewards. And a typical scheme within an organization is, is reward the top performers and ignore the low performers. So if you look at the right, the top right-hand box where you can see the incentives are the person on the bottoms is we ignore the bottom performers and the one at the top, we reward the top performers. And then the ones in the middle, they just get kind of left out, right? We've all been there. And so the two people watching the cartoon, they're like, we've seen this movie before. And then the note at the, at the, at the right says, a typical motivation scheme within organizations. We've seen this over and over again. And unfortunately, we've been programmed in corporate America in some organizations to do this. I mean, I literally went to management training on how to do this. And I'm sure many of you have too. So the conclusion came as this. As long as a task involves only mechanical skill, then bonuses worked, or monetary bonuses worked as expected. Meaning the higher pay, the higher you pay someone, then the better performance they get. But what happened is something changed once the task called for cognitive skills, meaning creative thinking. So once you um, applied cognitive skills, needed creative thinking, then a larger reward, actually a larger reward led to poorer performance. It was almost the inverse. So again, this is information that you can go check out. It's been documented. It's been long ago. So it was an incentive experiment, again, done by MIT, University of Chicago, and Carnegie Mellon, again, funded by the Federal Reserve Bank. So the whole experiment was based on economics. But contrary to the rule of economics, again, the thing shifted. So once you get above any rudimentary um, cognitive skills, then it's the other way around. Rewards don't really work. So that's why we have trouble on some of our projects. And so again, this was initially funded by the Federal Reserve Bank, but it's but this these experiments and these results have been replicated over and over and over again uh, in time by psychologists, by sociologists, um, industrial industrial psychologists. So you can see over and over again that these same these same um, thing the same conclusions arise. So money is an a motiv money is a motivator in that if you don't pay people enough. So thinking about your organizations, some of you do have the uh, some of you do have the capabilities to you know uh, set the pay level of your, your people. And some of you don't. But being reminded that money is a motivator in that if you don't pay people enough, then they won't be motivated. You have to give them the best use of money is to pay people enough money to take the issue of money off the table. So they're not thinking about the money. Like, hey, am I going to have enough money to pay my bills, to feed my family? They're, instead, they're thinking about work. So pay them at the level where you take that off the table. They're not in survival mode, and they're thinking about work. And so I, you know, I reiterate this just because this is, you know, we all this has been struggled with in time over years, years, hundreds of years, even beyond that. But now more than ever, specifically as we struggle in trying to recover from some of the economic conditions, these are some of the factors we're dealing with. Some people are trying to hire, some organizations are trying to hire some of the top-notch talent at some of the leading, uh, leading colleges, universities, institutions, but pay them 
not enough. So if they're not paying these top not talent enough so that they're not thinking about you know the base level money, then they're not thinking about work. So they're they're studying like, why isn't this working? We're hiring the top talent in the nation, but they're not paying them because they think, oh, well, we don't have to pay them anything. So if they pay them below the factor, then they're not going to produce. So now there are three factors that lead to better performance. And here's the better, better model that I like to talk about. So the bottom, the bottom picture here, or I'm even going to go back. So he, uh, you know at the top on the screen now you see the, the horse, it's really a donkey and the carrot. That's the, that's the old model that we're talking about. But down at the bottom where you see this other picture of the, the Scrabble pieces, where you see motivation that goes across and you see autonomy, mastery, and purpose. This is, these are now the three factors that lead to better performance and personal satisfaction. And I'm going to give you some examples that we know of today. And this is what's happening. This is the distinguishing factor. So the three, the three factors are, one, autonomy. It's the desire to be self-directed. So if you want engagement, uh, from your team, then let them be self-directed. Self-directed is better if you want engagement. For example, you know, some companies, there's a company that every Friday they announce, okay, for the next 24 hours, you can you work on anything that you want to. It does, you can work on uh, with who you want to work with, what you want to work on, and when, uh, as related to the project. But all that they require their people to do is, is to show your results at the end of the 24 hours. So basically, again, it's they're giving them the leeway to be self-directed on their project team to work to be self-directed in who, what, when, and how. At the end, they just have to show their results. And they, every time, get more better results. So it leads to this one day has led to fixing more issues, fixing more problems, uh, launching new products. Why? Because it's fun. They can have fun, they can have cake, they can have a party, they can do whatever they want as long as it's legal. And, and again, the results show that the autonomy, the self-directedness leads to better results. The second one is mastery. It's the urge to be better and um, better on stuff. So um, people aren't driven in this category. People, they don't need the money. They're not looking for fame. For example, like musicians, musicians practicing their instruments, uh, artists who work their craft. So if, it's, if they're not going to make money, then why do it? Well, because it's fun and you get better at what you love and that's satisfying for people. Again, this is all research you can go look up. And purpose. This one, so again, I'm seeing myself experiencing these not only with projects and organizations, but for myself personally. So the third one is purpose. So when purpose gets removed, bad things happen. So if people are working on projects or within organizations and they don't, they have no idea why they're doing it. It's like, what's our purpose? What's our, what's our company's purpose? Why are we doing this? Then it leads to bad customer service, lame services, uninspired places to work. And some of the companies you can go research, and Skype is actually one of them. Skype and Steve Jobs and many others, they're disruptive, but their, their technology or the, the services they're providing, they're disruptive to the market, meaning they're causing people in the market and the industry to look at things differently. And their whole goal is, their purpose is to make the world a better place. And these are the organizations, again, that are being disruptive, they're being innovative, they're trying to make a world a better place, and it provides more fulfillment for the people to work there. Um, so I, I do, I have the, I have the uh, benefit to work with many different nonprofit organizations. I've worked for Autism, which is now Autism, Speak, um, Autism Speaks. Uh, here in Atlanta, George Big Picture Foundation, multiple sclerosis, if you think about the cure for cancer, where women walk, women walk 60 miles on behalf of a cure. I don't know about you, but I'm doing good to walk half a mile. These women train 
to walk 60 miles for, to run to raise funds towards the cause of the cure for cancer. And these are some of the things. So in conclusion, if you treat people like people and not horses, like the carrot and the stick, the science says that it makes us better off in a world a little better. And that's what people, that's what motivates people. When you look at what motivates people, working backwards, motivate people, that helps you manage your projects better and lead teams. And so that's what makes a difference in managing projects. It's not just that one. It's these three components. It's leading teams, managing projects, and motivating people. So where can I start? People are like, I don't even know where to start. And then some people do. They're like, well, I'm, I've heard of this. This is not new. This is just a reminder. So here's where we started. Um, we took five big steps. We created training videos and webinars. We being we at projectmanager.com, we, you know, our purpose is to make pro projectmanager.com an online resource for people in the community. We've got a community of 500,000. We love being involved. So providing tools and techniques and building our community. We're learning from you and hopefully you're learning from us. Generating value-added content and developing our online software. So we, we invite you to join us. So this is where you can start. You know, if you don't know where to start, just take one simple step. And, you know, join us. Join us. You know, there are a lot of free things out there. There's the community. Free training videos, webinars, tools and techniques, community, value-added content, online software. We are a believer in pay it forward. Uh, we're, we hope to be paying forward to our community, and we hope you do likewise on your projects. And know you are. We see it every day in the comments happening in our community. So start there. If you start there, there's so many things that you can learn from you know, templates and information out there and connecting with others and building relationships. So for those of you who don't know, if you're not familiar with projectmanager.com, it's, you know, just like it sounds, projectmanageroneword.com. And if you want to explore it, just there's a free, we have a free trial out there. It's $25 value for free. You just go to the home page and start the free trial if you look to the screen. It's going to ask you to put your credit card information out there, but it doesn't bill you. This is a free trial, but that's just how merchant services work. So I hope this has been helpful. Again, this is one of my favorite topics in managing teams, and I hope that you know what we've talked about today in leading teams, managing projects, and motivating people, and looking at some next steps, I hope that, you know, the 10 traits, the four key factors, and two bonuses of leading teams, and the three ways, six capabilities, and five tools of managing your projects. And this just, this research, you know, again, if you want to go back and look, we gave you the, the link to go check out an animated version of that. It's very interesting. We're checking out. And then joining us. So we hope you found it of value, and we hope you visit us at projectmanager.com. So... Um, there, we're going to stay. What we typically do is we stay uh, about 10 minutes after for these questions that you want. I appreciate the questions here. I'm going to stay. So it's 1 o'clock now, so to be mindful of the end of the call, then uh, feel free to stay on. If you have questions, I'll take as many as I can. Uh, this session will be recorded, is, was recorded. This session was recorded, and like Tom said in the beginning, uh, the post-production process will be available. Um, we try to have that in 24 hours. So whether you registered and, and attended today or registered and didn't, the link will be sent to everyone. And uh, we hope you'll join us next, next month. And again, for those who want to stay on, I'm going to, at this moment, uh, in the call for the rest of you. If you want to stay online, I'll answer the questions I have. And thank you, and have a great day. So I'm going to start from Tom. Do you have, uh, I know you've been reviewing some of the questions, and you may have picked out some. Otherwise, I'm going to start kind of from the, the top and go down. Do you have some that you want to point out for me? Uh, there's one about uh, managing teams where the, the scope of the work is not defined in detail. Um, and the example is rehabilitation of a power plant. Like, how do you uh, handle that? 
Yeah, that's a great question, especially when we're talking about managing teams effectively. So if you look at the uh, third, the I mean the middle bucket we talked about, the managing projects, is really getting things defined and detailed. And as a project manager, you know, unfortunately, that's our that's our role and responsibility is to take that back to our uh, change. Basically, it would go back to the, your change control board and uh, insist that more details be outlined. But you know, if it's already passed by, if you already have received the the documentation and somehow it got through the process of of being approved, your project charter being approved, or whether it's a statement of work, estimate response document, then you need to take that back to your change control board and raise the issue because otherwise you're just chasing. You're, you're not managing your project, you are chasing it down the street. And that's just a no-win proposition. So the issue needs to be raised with your change control board. It needs to be documented. You need to take that back to uh, the stakeholders, the team, and get more details around that project. Otherwise, you're going to be in the number. You're going to be, you'll, you'll find yourself in a bad position of being in that number of, I don't know, the research shows what, 75%, 85% of failed projects. But great question. I hope that answered that. Another question is, um, what precautions do you need to take while uh, managing a team of people who are more competent than you are? Oh, well, yeah. Well, that's where when we let off the scenarios where we said, you know, you find yourself the accidental project manager or you happen to be, you know, find yourself walking down the, walking down the hallway and you get deemed the project manager. Um, you know, I'll have to say that could go two ways or maybe three ways. Um, I've seen it and experienced it both ways. Number one, I found, I found myself in the same position where my team has been more capable, more experienced, smarter than I am. And uh, luckily, I experienced that first early on in my career in uh, some opportunities that I had. And it worked out well, actually, because people knew that I was, I was, um, I guess, of mine to realize that and, and just state it. I had no other thing to say but like, look, I don't know. I, I've, I don't know all of this information. And really giving people, you know, not acting like I didn't act like I knew it all. And I was straight out of college after a couple of years and got some big opportunities, but leveraged my team. You know, if you're, if you're humble and you're, you just say it like it is and you tell people where you are in your experience level, people, what I found is people really do want to help other people. And so in that scenario, uh, the, my team members reached out and helped out a lot. And it was a great learning because <laughs> I was actually in charge of the project, but I learned so much along the way and I had support. I had stronger support in that situation because I said, I don't know it all. And I think when we are in a position to say, we don't know it all, sometimes that helps us because on the, on the flip side, if we act like we have it all together, we're the smartest one, everybody else doesn't know what they're talking about. You know, people resent that. And uh, sometimes due to the human psyche, we set ourselves up for people to sabotage our issues, our, our projects, sabotage us as project managers um, out of jealousy and all sorts of things. So, so look at it as it depends on how you look at it and your attitude. And going to people and say, hey, I really need some help here. I'm grateful for this opportunity and I look, I'm excited about this opportunity and know that I have a lot to learn. And leverage not only people on your team but other mentors, remember saying mentors. So seek out mentors who have been there, done that, and can guide you and teach you. Another question was, um, is leadership affected by organizational structures? Uh, for instance, flat versus hierarchical. hierarchical. Yeah, um, there, are, there are a lot of things documented on that. Um, I don't know if, you, um, uh, if you're familiar with PMI, the Project Management Institute, and their PMBOK guide, the Project Management Body of Knowledge. But that's a, I say that because there is, um, that's 
that's a framework for different, they have documented in there different project hierarchies and the position that the project manager takes. So whether it's, you know, functional organization where there are stovepipe, I mean, um, verticals where, say, if you're a project manager, again, I'm going to use my past life, my past life had in technology, so I was in the technology functional area, but my team members also were represented by sales, marketing, finance, and operations. So I had stronger, I had stronger um, leeway in, in my team and my authority than I did in the other organizations. I mean, I literally had really no authority in for sales and marketing or the other business units. So it does impact. And so I think a good resource to look at is again the PMI, the Project Management Institute, Project Management Body of Knowledge, and look at the dis different organizational structures and where you as a project manager sit. Um, and again, I, no matter what organizational structure, I really believe in building and nurturing relationships. If you can build and nurture strong relationships, it really doesn't matter what what organizational structure you're in because you know, you will know who are the people that are critical to my success. You know, what do I need, you know, what do I need from them? What do they need from me? How can we partner and build a relationship so that we make this project more successful? I think that's about all we have time for today, Jennifer. Yeah, there are a lot of great questions here. Some, again, asking I hope that uh, people are on here about um, this is recorded. We will be sending it out. You're welcome to email questions at support at projectmanager.com. If you need any instructions on how to log your Category C PDUs, then the best place to reference is PMI.org. PMI.org has the certification handbook. And again, you go to your account. You basically log into your account there, and they have instructions on how to do that. So again, thank you for attending with us and can't say it enough today. For those of you who observed today, I want to wish you a happy Valentine's Day and a great day and hope to see you next month. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, gang. Bye. Bye-bye.